I'd like to welcome uh, Jim Moffat to the stage. Uh, he is with Twitter. I'm going to let him introduce himself. But uh, so at Timescale, as we said, we've been growing and hiring a lot. And a few of Jim's former coworkers uh, just couldn't say enough about uh, the, the talks he gives, his interest and love of time series data and weather specifically. And I, I really appreciate your uh, willingness to come and, and just share some of that with us. Uh, it's it's I'm excited to learn. Yeah. Well, thanks, Ryan, and, and uh, it's great to be here. <clears throat> I do have a, a, a place in my heart for time series data. Uh, a lot of that comes from my background of working with weather data. Uh, so it's great to be here. I'm, I will say I'm super impressed with um, all of the topics that are being presented today. Uh, the inner geek in me, uh, I wish I could, you know, maybe I will, to, to attend the other talks as the day. I watched uh, two earlier ones, and they were great. Um, I have a feeling this talk will be a little bit less technical, so for better or worse. Um, so for everybody just to sit back and relax, and we'll start this uh, exploration. It's exciting. Great. So I'll share my screen. All right. So hi, everyone. My name is Jim Moffitt, and I am on the Twitter developer relations team. I'm coming live from my basement in Longmont, Colorado, which is not far from our, our Boulder office where that office has really become an engineering hub for Twitter uh, over the years. Uh, I'm gonna be presenting today about the intersection of Twitter and flood warning systems. And this is definitely my favorite Twitter data use case. Um, a little background here. Uh, before I started working with Twitter data and the services that provide that data, I spent a long time developing software for flood warning systems. Uh, these systems are based on, you know, real-time weather data collection, and these systems have the job of displaying the data and also providing ways to alarm and notify uh, on the state of that data. And so, you could, as you might imagine, um, this work involved working with a ton of time series data. Uh, it prob probably would have been incredible to have the tools that Timescale provides back in the day, but Needless to say, I had to do a lot of the querying and the managing of time series data just at, at a more you know, primitive level. Um, I started working with Twitter data almost 10 years ago. And given my history with flood warning systems, I wanted to mash up rain and tweet data. I wanted to better understand whether users were organically already using Twitter to communicate about floods uh, and other extreme weather. I mean, the questions were, does this rainfall drive more tweets? Uh, do people tweet in the rain? So back in 2013, I, I worked with 10 public agencies that operate flood warning systems. And this included agencies in Boulder, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, um, Louisville, Kentucky, and a few others. And I asked them to nominate one or two significant rain events that caused flooding. And we compiled data from rain gauges from those metropolitan areas. And then we compared that rain data with the hourly number of tweets. And here's a visual description of what, what we were comparing. On the left, you see a classic tipping bucket rain gauge. These things measure every millimeter of rain and then transmit a real-time data signal to a base station. And our goal was to assess whether, again, the public was already using Twitter to share these observations about flood and rain events. And of particular interest were tweets with photos and videos. So we geo-referenced tweets uh, uh, with any tweet geo, geo that was provided by the user, but we also scanned the tweet message for references. Um, you can see here, here a few example tweets uh, where you know people are talking about Vegas. So you know using different queries, you can pull in data that um, mentions keywords of interest. And this is what we found. Um, here's one example from a Las Vegas storm uh, from 2012. And keep in mind, this is pretty early in Twitter's uh, life cycle. Uh, that storm caused local flooding, property damage, and a death. Uh, the, blue bar, uh, the blue bars are hourly rainfall amounts. And the red line shows the hourly tweets that were geotagged to Las Vegas and matched our, our rain and flood queries. The gray line, which is really hard to see towards the bottom, 
That is the daily chatter that matched our queries from the week before. So everyday chatter. And this helped illustrate that the number of flood and rain tweets certainly spiked during the event. And we did this analysis for 11 other events and the results were similar. So we put together a series of blog posts to discuss that the public, yes, was already using Twitter to talk about specific rain events and that the volume of tweets seemed to increase with the volume of water. We also blogged about how public agencies could integrate the Twitter network to listen for uh, tweets of interest during the event and to extend the reach of their public communications. At this time, I also, you know, after leaving the flood warning world, I started, I restarted going to hydrology and flood warning conferences with this type of uh, analysis. And when I first started showing up at these conferences again, this was a common question I heard, like, what is Twitter doing at this hydrology conference? Luckily, I had a good story to tell. Uh, and this was the foundation of, of my message. And it's how the core characteristics of Twitter make it such a good match to be an extension of flood warning systems. That these core characteristics make Twitter a compelling public safety communication tool. Twitter is what is happening now. That's a tagline we've been using for a long time, but it, it still rings true. For conference attendees not too familiar, familiar with what Twitter is, these characteristics resonated with the public safety and flood warning uh, uh, crowd. I mean, first, obviously, tweets are public. It's a way to broadcast publicly to what can be a very large audience. Also, there's a private message layer, which is important, uh, that can be used for collecting more personal information during these events. Uh, it also provides a gateway into Twitter as a way for to enable users to maybe enroll into a notification system using private messages. Also, Twitter is extremely real-time. Uh, we have streams that can provide, if you're consuming one of our real-time streams, you can receive tweets in less than two seconds from where they when they were posted, you know, you know from all over the world. Uh, so Twitter has a real, um, real uh, a real real time nature to it. The other characteristics that resonate is like yes, it's mobile focused. It's concise content. Uh, people are likely to use Twitter on their phones. Uh, this comes into play when. Uh, maybe you want to build a crowdsourcing type system where you want, you know, you're going to encourage your users to send in photos and videos of events that are happening. Twitter is also built for sharing information and media. You can share links, you can share photos and videos. Um, also, Twitter provides many levels and layers of notifications. And that's really why you build flood warning systems is for those that last mile of sending notifications to the public. And also Twitter provides an API, which allows you to automate much of this and to really promote and enable efficient listening. So as I mentioned, uh, we published a blog post about all this, these characteristics, why it's such a good fit. And we, you know, the, the blog si uh, series focused on this data mashup that we did. And the third part was published at around noon on September 9th, 2013. And by later that night, the 2013 Colorado flood had started. And to this day, I have colleagues who are superstitious about that timing. Uh, but here's a rain accumulation around Boulder, Colorado for this event. The flood was driven by over 15 inches of rain over about two days. And if you're familiar with the Front Range of Colorado, we, you know, typically we get 18 to 20 inches in a year. So this was an, ex an intense extreme event. 10 people died, 18,000 people were displaced. Uh, 1,800 homes were destroyed, 200 businesses were destroyed. We lost 30 state bridges. It made traveling around this region quite challenging for you know many months and years afterwards. Uh, you know, many, many miles of roads were destroyed. All in all, it was a $4 billion economic uh, event. So many cities and counties and state agencies activated what we call their emergency operations centers. And Twitter became uh, a critical data source that they depended upon for communicating and listening to the public. And again, the mashup of rain and, and tweet data yielded some more interesting results. One result was that the audience tunes in and grows in real time during these events. 
And here we have an example of three different agencies uh, communicating to their audiences. But the unique thing here, or, or the common thing here, is that they're directing their Twitter users to the accounts that were on the ground that were actually managing the event, namely the Boulder Office of uh, Emergency Management and our local weather service office. So now let's look at some time series data that helps illustrate this. Here is the rain accumulation at a gauge in downtown Boulder, um, not far from where our office is. And you can see we got about 14 inches of rain over just a couple days. And what you see here are, are the new followers during this event to those two local agencies, the Boulder Office of Emergency Management and the National Weather Service Office in Boulder. These accounts gained 5,600 new followers during the event, which illustrating that your Twitter audience can grow during these emergency events and the importance of having other Twitter accounts, other agencies, uh, other you know, local governments know that your systems and your accounts exist and that they can direct their audience to you. Uh, obviously the takeaway here is like, it's sort of amazing to me how these lines sort of have a, a similar uh, shape and, uh, and cadence. Okay, so now, now I think a fun part of this talk is uh, let's let's take a world tour of flood warning systems. I'm going to show some examples that help illustrate how floods unfold on Twitter. We're going to uh, review or take a look at a crowdsource system in Jakarta, and then we're going to um, show some examples of system systems that use Twitter to broadcast river and weather and river gauge data. So here is uh, our early prototype I, I developed uh, right after the 2013 Colorado flood. And its intent was to show uh, just how this event unfolded on Twitter. What this was, we collected tweets from the event. We are spe uh, specifically interested in geotag tweets where we knew the user shared their location. And we we're also focused on tweets with photos and videos. And I shared this tool at a couple of hydrology and early warning conferences to demonstrate the heavy use of Twitter during floods. And it's fair to say that one thing that resonated with the audiences was the type of information shared during the event, the quality of photos and video descriptions of what was happening on the ground, and actually the volume of, of geotag tweets. And with this tool, you know, you could zoom in and out on the map, uh, you could move through the through the event temporarily and just see how uh, things progressed. This is a more recent example. Um, this was built to explore the types of conversations that happened on Twitter during the uh, during Hurricane Harvey back in 2017. We collected over a million Harvey related tweets and delineate, delineated them into top themes from the event. And those themes were things like hurricane information, you know, basic stuff coming from weather service or the National Hurricane Center or local agencies. Another obvious common theme was crowdsource observations, you know, the hundreds of thousands of videos and photos that were taken during the event. I remember during Hurricane Harvey, like watching my Twitter feed, just trying to get a sense of the scale uh, of what was going on. Other themes were there's a special theme that we found around SOS, rescue tweets. Uh, during this event, some cell phone networks, I think AT&T went down and Twitter sort of emerged as a way of real time discussion and, and people are reaching out or helping to coordinate rescues. Um, another common theme were, were animals, uh, you know, pets, like what do I do? I lost my pet or where do I go to find pets? And obviously around the Houston area and Texas in general, it's a large agricultural area. So there's tons of conversations around livestock and just, you know, what to do, um, how to help. And then uh, finally, the recovery phase. Uh, Twitter, of course, was part of that conversation as well. People, you know, people looking to volunteer or to donate or agencies looking for, for help as well. And you can imagine a real-time version of this to better understand what's, what's happening on the ground. Uh, I like to show this example, it's just a quick one about how a tweet can be more than 100, 280 characters. You know, tweets can have up to four images, and here we have what could be an automated system of sharing uh, graphs and tables. And I also like to show that with this, this is some Ruby code using a very popular Ruby gem uh, that's referred to as the Twitter gem. 
Uh, some of this is hard coded, but it's just to show that you know, with about twenty lines of code, you could you can you can automate the posting of these types of tweets. So now let's go to Jakarta in Indonesia. Now condi conditions in Jakarta are make for a perfect storm for annual floods. I mean, first hydro, you know, on the hydrologic level, there are around seven rivers that flow into the Jakarta Delta. And Jakarta is a lot like New Orleans with respect to having areas below sea level. And second, socially use of Twitter and other social media networks in Indonesia is just off the charts. These conditions made Jakarta a perfect place uh, to build a crowdsourced flood warning system. And Peta Bacana is a research foundation uh, that, has, that has helped create this system. We started back in 2014 working with a group of smart city researchers in Australia to help uh, build this system. Uh, and the system listens for tweets coming into their account. And if the tweet doesn't include an exact location shared by the user, the system automatically responds to that user and asks them to geotag and provide their location. And this display um, that I'm showing here uh, shows all of the geotag tweets that arrived in just their first year of operation. This would have been back in 2014. So if you look carefully, you know you can see waterways and major uh, roads. Uh, the 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 black line is the extent of the city of Jakarta. Well, unfortunately, the Twitter mobile app stopped supporting users sharing their exact location a couple of years ago. But the good news is the Twitter platform can be used in very creative ways. And in their case, what they did to handle that, the fact that users couldn't share an exact location, you can still share things like places, I'm in Boulder, Colorado, I'm at a certain venue, but the loss of uh, the exact coordinates of location was sort of key. So what they did was they built their own mobile app and they continue to use Twitter to reach out to the public and instead send links to their app. And this app has rich mapping features and enables users to pin their exact location. They can also use uh, an easy way to describe the depth of the water. You can see the graphic here on the right. They can move that line up and down. Uh, it reflects the depth in centimeters. And with this system, you can also share your photos and videos. And behind it all, they, they provide a, a website that compiles these incoming reports. And, you know, and this also you could you could share a report right here through the website. But another thing this group has done that really makes this system so successful is that they've done an excellent job educating and coaching the public that it exists. They have worked with cooperating public agencies, governments at all levels, student groups, celebrities and sports stars. Uh, they use PSAs and things like billboards and taxi advertisements. They've just done a great job of letting the public know that, hey, during a flood, we really need your observations. Know that your observations will be shared publicly on a map. You're going to be helping others. And it's been quite successful. And they have also uh, recently expanded the system to the Philippines. I love this example because it illustrates that anyone can build a Twitter integration. And here is another, another example with weather data. So what you're seeing here is basically just a, a, a tweet bot, something that just tweets out in an automated fashion. And uh, so this, this Twitter account posts weather data in real time from a weather station in Pennsylvania. And it was put together by an old friend of mine from my flood warning days. This friend is a genius when it comes to building field systems that measure and communicate weather data, but he did not know a thing about the Twitter API uh, or building web apps for that matter when he started. And with just a little help from me, he was able to build this. So just the, the bottom, uh, the underlying message there is that building a Twitter bot is really quite trivial. So now, now let's go to the UK. Um, here is a system that's put together by a group called, uh, well, the system is called GageMap. And what they have here is a system that broadcasts over 3,200 river sensors, and each sensor has its own Twitter account. It broadcasts river level reports mostly, and most of these have defined flood triggers. So when a system, so the system becomes much more active when it's flooding. But what's unique about this is, you know, especially if you live in the 
in England and, and you know parts of Scotland, Ireland, and Northern Ireland, you can you can pick a, a one of these Twitter accounts that's near where you live, say, and you can follow it. And it's going to be pretty quiet. It may report you know once a day. Some might report hourly, but when it's flooding, it's going to uh, pick up and uh, you'll get a lot more information. And this group took the immense task. Uh, or did the immense task of creating over 3,200 Twitter accounts. Now that's not an easy feat because you, you can't automate the creation of a Twitter account. So I guess the story is they hired a bunch of interns and they spent all summer just uh, creating Twitter accounts to help support the system. And if, if you go to one of these, if you click in through that map and you go to one of these Twitter accounts, this is what it looks like. Again, it's just a simple Twitter bot. Uh, in their case, they transmit out, I think this one is maybe every hour, uh, but they, you know, they automate the creation of a graph and share that in the tweet. And I picked this one because uh, when I, in my younger days, I spent a summer uh, working in London. This is a gauge from near where I lived. And lastly, um, Here's a system in Texas that was built by the USGS Water Science Center, Center in Austin. And here we see a screenshot of what they call the Texas Water Dashboard. Uh, so it's a web and mobile app that provides data, uh, maps, and Twitter feeds. And they share real-time flood data with, with two Twitter accounts. There's a USGS underscore Texas flood and a USGS underscore Texas rain. The Texas flood account broadcasts data from over 400 river gauges uh, uh, when they're in flood stage. And the Texas rain account broadcasts from another 400 rain gauges when flooding is likely. So they work with the weather service to and their models to uh, know when areas are going in the flood stage or when there's rain in the area that will likely trigger um, uh, rain. And so this illustrates a more simple account model where data from many weather and flood sensors are posted with just one Twitter account. And these tweets are all geotagged with the location of where the data is from. So this system can be used to share data and from other public agencies, TV and other media organizations, universities, researchers, and, and the public. Uh, this is again, what one of, the, one of those accounts looks like. Uh, on a sunny day in Texas, this feed's quite quiet, but uh, when a big system's rolling through, it can get quite chatty. So that's the end of uh, the tour of flood warning systems. Uh, I see I am getting close to uh, my 20 minutes. Uh, I wanted to mention a couple things though about the Twitter API. We are we launched the, the start of the version two of the Twitter API about 18 months ago. And we are currently in a cadence where we are releasing new endpoints on a monthly basis. Uh, if you want to get started, here's some links. Uh, you can sign up for what we call essential access, which gives you something like a million tweets a month. It gives you access to all the different endpoints for collecting tweets, for posting tweets, et cetera. Uh, we have uh, you know, new documentation for V2. Uh, the API tools, that's kind of exciting new thing we have. Uh, you can just go to our, our docs and you can start interacting with the API uh, with just a few clicks. We also have Twitter community forum. If you're digging into Twitter um, for the first time, I mean, I, ho I hope you enjoyed these uh, examples from the flood warning world, but I'm sure there's many in the audience who have your own uh, favorite use case. And I can assure you, regardless of what your use case is, you're going to find conversations and data and related uh, pieces of information on, within the Twitter data. And finally, if you're looking for uh, what our roadmap looks like, uh, I shared a link there as well. So thank you, Ryan. I, now we can open up for questions. Well, I just want to, two things. I want to say first, your power, literally, they took me off the screen for you to start your talk about flood warnings and this enormous torrential rainstorm started outside my window. <laughs> it was like uncanny and weird. I was like, what just happened? That was so... Good work. Um, yeah, it's but at least, uh, a couple of times, just, right? Oh, I love the mug. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So yeah, I want to briefly talk about the V2 of the Twitter API, because I think there's so, it's been so interesting to think about Twitter data as time series data. Like we, we get honed in on a tweet, you know, a subject. And so to illustrate this, uh, we're actually doing a talk about uh, consuming tweets at the end of the day. So I have my Wordle results here for the day. I'm going to go ahead and tweet it. 
and nice. in about three seconds it's going to show up in our database, which is just amazing to me. Like yeah. that yeah. happens as part of the talk. So where are you at with the V2 API? Is it something that, you know, what's the future? Is it something that's going to replace the current API? Where are you guys at with that? Yeah, I'd say we're about halfway through that mission. I mean, that is the end goal. It will be the replacement of the current uh, Twitter API that really has been around since before 2012. And that's one reason we launched this whole campaign is like a lot of uh, the current API is built on, you know, very old infrastructure. Um, and it's really been quite exciting for us and the DevRel team, but also our engineers to work on new stuff and to, it's really been rebuilt from the ground up. And what we're seeing and we're re realizing the goal that after doing all the back end and infrastructure work that we are now in a position to roll out more and more endpoints at a quicker pace. Uh, you know, just last week we, we uh, launched, we have a new, you know, people maybe may use Twitter bookmarks, for example, to save tweets for reading later. Well, we've never had an API around that. Well, now we do. You can, you can list tweets, you can, you can post or, you can you can list bookmarks. You can you can make bookmarks. Um, we're just trying to get the API to have more parity with the experience you can have directly on the Twitter app. I mean that's sort of the north star of this. Um, and I'd say you know for some of the core endpoints, we are already there. We already have our our replacement for streaming. We already have our replacements for search. Uh, both of those will have more and more features rolled out to get true parity with what we can provide today. Um, but yeah, we're we're in a good place with V2, um, and again, we're we're launching a lot of net new functionality. There's stuff that developers have asked for for years. Like, I want to tag somebody in a photo through the API. Well, you could never do that before, and now you can. And we have new features on Twitter. Like, I don't know if any all you're all familiar with Spaces. Well, as we roll out Spaces, this is a new thing at Twitter. We're rolling out the API in support of it as well. That's great. Just really quickly, last question: What it, what most excites you about some of the updates to the API from a time series data perspective? Like, what do you see the the possibility? Looking at some of these warning systems as an example. Yeah, I mean, I think I mean, I'm just really happy that you know this. We're not losing any functionality. I'm like, I I kind of got my chops and started working with with Twitter on the enterprise side of things. We have a special set of, today, we have a special set of enterprise endpoints that, yeah, you have to pay money to use and they're very high performant, but it's been great to see that those enterprise, uh, also in search, those enterprise endpoints are becoming the foundation for V2. So for me, that's exciting because uh, back, um, you know, before V2, you had to be in the enterprise world to really get access to this stuff. And a real goal of V2 is A, to make to make the endpoints consistent across the board. As a developer, you're gonna appreciate that. Like when you parse JSON from a tweet, no matter where you got it with V2, it's gonna be the same type format. Uh, and yeah, and that it's really opening the door, especially to the academic community. We've done a great job of working with academics uh, and researchers and really opening up the gates for how much data they can an analyze and having these features that used to be only enterprise. That's awesome. Jim, this is really exciting. I, I appreciate yeah, I appreciate you joining us. Uh, you know, it just shows that time series data is everywhere, even in the most uncommon places that you don't think about. And those are just great illustrations. I love seeing how you know, people can build on top of what you guys are doing. Great yeah. work. Thank you so much for, for your time today. It's been great. Well, thank you for having me and uh, thank you everybody for listening.